much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, this is a great space. I, I feel like we're in a nightclub, and I'm, I'm wishing that I had like you know a driving bass beat behind what I have to say. So uh, we'll see. And if you can't hear me, wave your hands or something, and I'll I'll try to be louder or more visible or something like that. But um, I wanted to talk. Uh, about sort of a broad issue. And this broad issue has a lot to do with how we get information today and whether we're getting what we need. Um, so if this seems a little abstract or a little off the topic of things like blogging, that's because it is. And uh, I, I hope some of it will relate, but we're going to go very high before we sort of drill down. So we'll see how it works. Um, but I wanted to start by talking a little bit about how media historically has worked. And so I put up a, a photo of uh, the person who in the United States tends to symbolize journalism uh, for most Americans, uh, which is uh, Edward R. Murrow, who ended up reporting on World War II um, for CBS News uh, from the United Kingdom. And this notion of a single guy in front of a microphone is how many of us sort of grew up with journalism, the idea that journalism comes from a single individual who's giving you the news in one fashion. And, and this is actually a paradigm that we're all pretty used to. We're used to this idea that journalism is coming out from uh, a single voice. That voice might be a newspaper. We might have a lot of different newspapers. But someone at some point is making that editorial decision that this is news, this is important to us, we're going to pay attention to it in one fashion or another. Um, sometimes the people who are making these decisions aren't people we really know about or really think about. This is one of the most powerful information systems ever invented. Uh, and this is part of a newswire system. Uh, and this is newswires in the very early days before they were computerized. The way that newswires like AP or Reuters or AFP would work is they would send you information uh, via a teletype machine. And the teletype machine would produce a paper tape and you would hang that paper tape on the wall. You knew which ones were which stories. And when you wanted to run that story in your newspaper, you would feed the tape in to a linotype machine, which would set the type and produce the story. So newswires are incredibly powerful. And they're, they're even more powerful today than we usually think of them. When you go on to something like Google News or Yahoo News, an enormous number of, that, uh, of, of the stories uh, within that network are coming from a newswire. And who controls that newswire and who gets on that newswire ends up being uh, a really important and really political debate. It was a huge political debate, actually, in the 1970s. And there was a whole movement in the United Nations through UNESCO to democratize newswires. People were very worried that the news we were getting in our newspapers was coming mostly from either French, British, or American companies, either from AFP, from Reuters, from Associated Press. And so the idea was we needed a newswire for the South. We needed a newswire for the developing world. And that's what this panel at the UN proposed doing. And they never pulled it off. But it was very interesting. They realized that if no one is listening to you on that newswire, no one is listening to you. They're not paying attention to you in the newspapers, not paying attention to you in radio. So what, what are your ways to speak back in this age? There aren't very many of them. You can write a letter to the editor. And again, you're hoping that that publication is going to hear what you have to say and to choose to share your information. Or you can speak in public. This is a photo from um, Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park in London. Uh, and this is not a very effective way to communicate your point. You'll, you'll discover that the one guy standing on the soapbox is being listened to, if he's lucky, by three or four different people. But this is all changing, and changing very, very quickly. And it started to change for many of us in 1991, when we started seeing the World Wide Web emerge. And it wasn't clear what this change was going to mean for information, for news. When this technology started, when the World Wide Web started, this was a tool for physicists. This wasn't a tool for ordinary people to publish. That potential's always been there. If you talk to Tim Berners-Lee, um, who wrote the original protocol for the World Wide Web when he was uh, researching at CERN, he knew that he wanted the web to be read-write. He wanted people to have the capability 
of saying what they wanted to say and publishing it to the world, as well as getting that information back. But in this era of the web, that wasn't very easy to do. You had to know how to write an HTML. You had to have access to a server. You had to set up a web server. All that has changed recently. And what we've seen with what people are calling Web 2.0 is this idea that there are now tools that make it much, much easier for the average individual to publish online and to speak to a larger audience. So for me, this is a really interesting shift in what's going on in the web environment. Suddenly, we've all got this ability to speak back. We've got this ability to have a voice. And we're no longer controlled by whether our letter to the editor gets printed. That's not the block anymore. So there's no longer that gatekeeper deciding, if you don't make it into the paper, your idea doesn't get uh, expressed or played with. But there's other blocks, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. But basically, here's what this shift is. In Web 1.0, it was for physicists. In Web 2.0, it's for everybody. And what that means is that everybody can publish, everybody will publish, and everybody will publish really silly stuff. Once we've seen what people are capable of doing in this new world, we realize that not all of this stuff is serious, not all of it is political, not all of it is news. It's going to include a lot of people publishing cute photos of their cats. Uh, and that, in fact, appears to become one of the main uses of the web. As this gets more democratic, it looks less and less like a newspaper. It looks more and more like participatory media. And participation might look more like a journal. It might look more like notes to your friends. It might look more like a scrapbook. Participation isn't just related to those Web 2.0 tools. It's related to the fact that it's gotten so much easier for us to create content and create even very rich content. Uh, one of the speakers on the main stage was expressing the idea yesterday that sharing photos really kicked in once we started having camera phones and having camera phones becoming widespread. Most of us don't carry a camera with us all the time. But most of us nowadays do carry a phone all the time. And so nowadays, we all carry a camera all the time. And that means that we tend to generate huge amounts of content. We may or may not share it. We might just keep it on our phone. But increasingly, there's a lot of services and a lot of incentives for people to find ways to share this content. So this site, Photolog, has become hugely popular, mostly in Latin America. It's actually a US-based site. But they found that most of their users are in Brazil or in Chile. And what I find really interesting about this is you'll see that in Chile, there's 4.9 million Photolog members. There's only 16 million people in Chile. So what that's basically saying to you is that something like one in three people in Chile is using this service. So whether or not you are currently creating content and putting it out there, the generation that's coming online now, the people who are just starting to use these tools, that's going to be their default. So the people who started using the internet when I started using the internet, we thought it was about email. And the web was sort of a surprise. And we figured that professionals would publish web pages. The people who are coming on now have an entirely different default for how they handle that. And the assumption now is that you're going to publish content, you're going to share it very widely. And this is going to change the rules. It's no longer about it being difficult to get published in the newspaper. Now the challenge is figuring out how you find things. If everyone can publish and everyone does publish, we end up with a lot of information. We end up with it very, very quickly. So this is a screenshot from Google in 2005. And this is a screenshot from Google in 2008. And there's a difference between the two. It's kind of subtle. There's actually a couple of differences. But the difference that I'm interested in is that number, searching 8.1 billion web pages. Google stopped publishing that number shortly after that screenshot. So that screenshot is a cop 